2020 budget discussion going, and Mike, I turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah so we're, we're going to tag team a little okay. bit. We um, a little bit of a recap of just our process in general, and I can get to this year's. We've kind of been through all the, the budget conversations um, across the breadth of the budget, and also then had outside agencies approach you. So historically, we'll cap encapsulate all that into what we call issues and options, and try to articulate each one of those, and and give you options related to those and ask for your preliminary direction, all with the intention of then finalizing a draft budget to share with you. I think we shared in a previous study session, our last week's study session, kind of that timeline. So we've got a little bit of flexibility in that calendar if we need to have some more conversation. But the goal today would be to get through all of the issues and options and anything else you, you want to factor into the budget so we can, as staff, pull together a draft for you and, and give it to you next week. Um, all with the intention of kind of keeping on the timeline of, of publication and then meeting the state's uh, submission deadlines. So with that, we, uh, no particular order, identified uh, the issues and options that you have, uh, you should have gotten last week. You have a packet of information that's kind of the background information as well as identifying um, options for your consideration for each one of those requests. So taking it from the top, uh, we have outside agency requests and starting with the uh, uh, visit Salina um, and made a presentation to you previously and <coughs> incorporated the uh, information that they provided. And so um, I'm just going to turn it over to you for any questions you might have. Staff will try to answer them for you and try to get some direction in terms of how you'd like to proceed. And the way this is divided out is based on the fact of their anticipation of what they think they're going to bring in. Uh, the current state guest tax and they're three percent correct. Yeah, correct. Um, um, yeah, as, as you recall, as the uh, transient guest tax allocation mm -hmm. is broken out, and they they receive uh, three cents of that six point seven cents. And uh, year end, there's kind of a true up in terms of what actual performance is compared to projections. And just to just to be clear, how much we we had requested in house our individual departments to stay at a. Um, to stay flat in terms of budget for correct, and even in some cases, a reduction of three to five percent. Well, as we look at the 2019 budget, we tried to identify contractual and commodity, so not the entirety of the budget, and then personnel expenses, that type of thing. And we set a goal of five percent, and you know, we didn't hold every department to exactly five percent, but that was our target for each department, and then overall. So 2019, the 2019 adjustment was a five percent reduction. Tried to budget to the 2019 number at the same time. Okay, and I think that that's just kind of what informs my uh, some of our outside contracts, <laughs> and I don't know uh, what the other commissioners feel, but in terms of just starting like with with visit Salina, I was wondering about um, freezing at the 2019 budget numbers and then applying like. A, whatever the consumer price index is to that. And I know we've got a little bit different calculation in terms of how Visit Salina is calculated with the transient guest tax. And so there right. might be some additional well, ordinance, ordinance issues, but it's something that we had talked about it in the past. And so I think that's going to probably be some of my requests going, and, going forward. And this is one additional clarification, I guess. Um, we do have a standing agreement with, with Visit Salina and the CDB. So by way of that agreement, I mean, we agree to pass through that, that three cents. So unless we renegotiated that agreement, and, and that's something that we've talked about mm -hmm. as it relates to increasing the transient gas tax, I don't know that we're, we have the discretion as it currently stands to, to you know, dial that number back. It's really more of a pass. Gotcha. And I guess, I mean, I would just look at my fellow commissioners in terms of saying, I know we've had some discussions about changing some things with the transit guest tax. Is right. that something that we are interested in renegotiating with Visit Salina? In my mind, as we move forward, we've looked at, you know, we've discussed how we may pay for some of the 
some upgrades to the facilities and stuff through a, perhaps an increase in the transient gas tax at that time, I think we would look at, at, you know, here's what we hope to generate through additional transient gas tax, and how is that additional transient gas tax shared with business line and so on and so forth. So I think that contract and that discussion may happen in my mind when we, we look if, you know, we raise the transient gas tax talked about. I would agree with that. I mean, as far as this budget is concerned, I think for um, the Chamber's <laughs> position, you know, we're fine where we are, but uh, going forward at this point, you know, we should have some type of a, of a review. Some type of a cap on that. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with that, too. Yeah. But, I don't know if I'd use the word cap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. 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 And, and I think they do a lot of work, and it's sort of question. And, right. and that just sidetrack is too far. I, I feel a little guilty in possibly injecting some confusion because I think I drew the, the term of the cap on there. But what I, what I was really trying to accomplish is that there not be a proportional sharing of whatever transient guest tax increases might uh, support for the purpose of the baseball enterprises project. So if we were to leave them whole, we'd leave them at three, three cents and then whatever transient guest tax increase there might be could be all be funneled towards the baseball enterprises project. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation about what right. that will support and how long we finance that debt. Right. But I think, you know, as long as we're, we're just aware of the fact that that's a conversation that can maybe happen as we go to look at things, you know. That was Thank you. And to the point that, uh, uh, you know, we're expecting our own in house department to, to uh, well, stay in the line this year. I didn't. I'm, I didn't I'd listen to the conversation that about applying that same idea to the agencies that we're funding this year. Okay. Um, item number two, I, I may have good news for you. That that relates to the Santa Airport Authority and the marketing <laughs> funds for um, their air service. And historically, they provided sixty thousand um, dollars, and as part of the contribution for about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars of expense, I believe. Uh, and speaking with Tim Rogers, the there are, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but they're, because of their federal status and, and receiving federal funding, a portion of the sales tax collected on, on fuel that comes to us is obligated to go back to uh, the airport. I think it estimates about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. So he, what he indicated is they did not need to renew the request for marketing funds as it relates to this item. They would make use of that uh, pass through of fuel uh, sales tax. Way to make it work. So I don't know that you have issue number two on your plate. That's just a pass. Um, I just had a question in terms of how we have, um, like when we, how we've handled extra additional funding for airport authority marketing expenses in the past, like with uh, the Baker Donaldson um, uh, lobbyist contract, and you know I think we've had some other marketing efforts. Does that come out of this pot? Or no. Um, this pot was separate, and then as we got those other requests, the Baker Donaldson, for example, that from you directly. It does, however, all come out of the economic sales tax economic development fund. Okay. So it comes out of the same pot of money, but it's not coming out of the sixty thousand. Okay, I got you. So the twenty percent is what they anticipate now, but that could it, it could, could have change, another separate could change if they have it. Okay. Right. Okay. They would bring that separate. So item number three is uh, funded downtown Inc. And uh, if I could provide that to you in, in kind of columns of supplemental funding, facade and funding, and then historically capital improvement funding. So uh, the request you, you have for you this year is considering the supplemental funding of 45, and they've asked for an increase of 25,000 for the facade funding. Um, one thing that, that I've had a conversation with some of you about is part of the star bond funding and, and uh, the CID funding actually you may recall that there was an allocation of a portion of that fund 18 almost 19 percent to um, existing building improvements and then there's another pot for new um, uh, business improvements and so if you take the projections over 20 years that equates to I believe about 1.4 million about 72 thousand a year of those 20 years and that's all pay to go 
And so the CID district is now formed and should be put on here pretty soon. And then all the spinoffs and spring break. So um, they're not exactly the same. I mean, the facade funds are limited to the facades. Where but the star bond funds could be used for facade. They could. They could also be used for the interior. interior also. I had made a note to, to drop the facade back to 50 just because of the star bond funding. But we would uh, have that available and that will build up over the next 12 months. That was just kind of, yeah, just I, kind of keep in line with what we're doing with other budgets. So if we did that, and they did find the facade requests were substantial or more, we could fix that. Uh, we could, uh, certainly in a future budget year, if it comes in the 2020 year, in the overall scheme of things in terms of our general fund budget, 25000 uh, not going to throw us off on a minute budget to be tight. So we can certainly respond in, in future years. And SDI is great about providing an accounting of who's received grants and what funds have been received and, and balance it. I know in years past there's there's been a big conversation about you know we haven't had a lot of applications, fund balances getting all high and manage that down. So we can certainly continue to have the, the dialogue. All the last year's money used? No, right right now we have thirty three thousand left to award for the rest of 2019. So the grants can be awarded up to 15,000. I do anticipate having one or two more applications come in this year. So there's a chance that we could be out by the early 2020, or there's a chance we could have just a little carryover. Because um, I, I would hope that as the major projects get finished and folks are filling in the smaller storefronts, for lack of a better term, um, there might be an increased request Next year, I mean, next year is the year I would anticipate the request would go up as, as people move in and fill in the spaces. So I, if, it's, if it's being used, I guess I'd be in favor of even at this increased amount. Because after about three or four years, I would imagine most of the facades are going to be pretty much set with whatever the downtown to the core is. But uh, there's, there's still a fair number of empty, empty buildings. So what kind of Starbound money will that offset that? I think there's so many people in line for that Starbound money because there's a pecking order for it. But there is, but there's also a segregation of, of funds. So there's some for new businesses, some for existing businesses. And, and so the replacing the facade program would probably come under that existing business. Pot rather than new businesses. Although, if you have, I guess if you have a new tenant that wants to make five facade improvements, they can make use of the other pot of money. Um, and so, look, so there's reasonable anticipation of the money. In that yeah, the, th and the thing about the CID is it is actually an increased sales tax rate, so it, it will impact not only new increments, but it will generate just based off of just sales tax. So, uh, There'll be a timing issue in terms of collecting it and having it available and set aside and being able to distribute on a pay as you go basis. But it should generate, you know, will certainly generate something based on the current phase. Does that and money come back from the state like our other sales tax? Yeah. It'll be reimbursed for us. It's, yeah. and then, it's separated too right. as, as the ID. It did go into effect on July 1st, so we'll start seeing that collection in September. And the development so basically we'll have, maintain it we'll have six fun. months of collection even before we get to 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We won't get six months. But, but we, yes, we, yes. we would have accrued up to yes. six months. Do they, they pay two months, 60 days in arrears? Yeah. Yeah. The first 200000 will go to the master developer before anybody else sees it. So depending on how it comes in, I, I don't know what the first, I don't know how long that'll take to reach the 200000 So it'll take longer than... I mean, it'll, it will start seeing it in yeah. September, but that'll go to the master developer okay. before those different pots of funding, before we see it. Yeah. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so we might not actually, well, where? I ask that, but do we have a projection in your crystal ball, anybody's, <laughs> as to uh, how much and by when you really expect money? I don't know if Mike can remember, but what was our base? Uh, tax, 
morning. I wonder where it was. Yeah, yeah, asking there is it likely that there would be more than two hundred thousand in that pot in um, November or, or this time next year. It's hard to know. Other than with construction there, I'm sure that that's going to have some effect on this vote too. I mean, that would be my honest opinion. Um, but once you start seeing that, then it may in 2020 when we have a full year, I don't doubt that we'll get that 200,000 and go over. Well, while my while my looking at that, just to because I kind of with Commissioner Hoppet on this one in terms of holding it at the 2019 level. Um, that's not to say that like SDI internally couldn't make some changes if they saw that the money was being used up too quickly on big projects. That the board couldn't come back and say, okay, we're going to have to put um, a lower, you know, maybe look at re how the uh, facade grants and the facade forgivable loans are, are, are awarded and maybe put a lower limit in order to, you know, spread the, yeah. yeah, distribute it a little bit more evenly too. Right. What, what's been the average grant amount? So between ten to fifteen thousand. So basically three or four. Yeah. Yeah. And, and recognizing that there's some expectation of growth over time. It's not year one being the same as year twenty. But the projections for the downtown CID district uh, over twenty years are seven point five million, which is Three hundred and seventy-nine thousand a year. Is that right? And so, um, with that first two hundred thousand coming out, that in a twelve-month period, I'd have still been at one hundred eighty thousand. Forty point six of that would go to uh, to maintenance, security, and programming, which we're working out that transfer year agreement. One percent of that uh, up to fifty thousand would go to Old Chicago. 39.5% to new retail improvements and 18.9% to existing retail. So the development agreement spells out all those allocations and requires us to maintain those separate funds. But it's that first year, you're not going to see that much. And then, yeah, I, I mean, the hotel won't even mm -hmm. open until right. 20. Right. And the alley, what, November? <coughs> I'm glad to hear that. Right. Uh, so it'll be some, some additional. Some additional. If I agree, I mean, that would be a great future pot to take money from. I just don't know if it's going to be there next year. I think some will. I don't know exactly how much. Does the developer get two hundred thousand dollars every year, or just the first two hundred thousand, and then fifty thousand, and then everything right. else starts coming back into the agency pocket? Right. So in the first year, if you have three hundred seventy-five thousand roughly coming in, the first two hundred fifty is gone. So you have one hundred twenty-five thousand coming into these other pots. Now, is that based on just the three or four major uh, sales tax generators, or is that no, downtown yeah. built out? To whatever it's going to end up being. Well, this this is a one percent additional sales tax across the board. So, in addition, it, so it is all the base sales that we, you know, are seeing today, regardless of any new businesses, and then it's any additional sales that are the result of the hotel and the alley and any other development downtown. So you got uh, you're adding one percent to our existing sales activity, regardless of any sales, and then you're capturing one percent on top of. New development. Well, I just you know, if they have ten people come in and they want to really fix up their front, you'd have to be in a position to say, okay, we need to go find that hundred thousand dollars. I mean, if it's going to make the difference between the way downtown looks. And I think it's, it's a one shot deal, but it's like to get it looking nice the first time. 
I'll find the 25 someplace else. <laughs> Next week we start the Ken Curry. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there, I mean, some of you have uh, articulated you know, individual thoughts, but is there a consensus on this one? I mean, if, if it's likely there's money that's going to be in the CIB fund, then you know, as long as they, there's a back door to get more money or a side door. Well, and I think That's an acknowledgement too that their board may need to make some adjusting in terms of it, the amount of the awards. I mean, we're asking all of our departments to spend at zero or negative growth. I really feel like this is, unfortunately, this is just a crappy year. I mean, I agree. As long as the person's surf area, there may be some services for which we have to increase. Yes, it may be a year where we, it's more of an all or none rather than across the board type of situation. It's a valid service that's going to pay off dividends down the future. That may be, next year may be the year you put money into it rather than take money out. But I do think, you know, there's, there's obviously the 50000 that we've been doing every year. So then the question becomes, well, will the CAB spin off another? And I think it will spin off some. There's some you know, division into dedicated funds and some prioritization. But I think if we're truly talking January 1 to December 31 of 2020, I, I think they should spin off an additional revenue for that particular pot. Would it be an opportunity if we, just, if we agreed on 50? For the middle of the year, if, if it just goes like crazy, and, and we're in the board is a little bit more diligent on how they're awarding out the the money, for us to come back and re, and request that additional twenty five. I mean, I know you need to budget it now, but we certainly have an update. I, I don't know where we are yeah, budget wise. Yeah, yeah. 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 that was my original thought. But then we're being more consistent about yeah. applying the same discipline to everybody, and it's a 25 is only about one and a half requests, so I think we'd be back anyway. So and we just as likely to be over the 75 as you would with 50. So. When we requested at the beginning of the year, when I sent Debbie a request, I could just request the 50 and not the extra 25 unless it's needed. I, I don't know if that's helpful or. Well, by the time we have a balanced budget, someone else is, uh, assuming we, we it, unless, the only, the only way that really works is if. We are able to budget in a way that we increase the general fund reserve balance and then you know, maybe increase any of the free balance that. So, um, that. We, we certainly could do a six month update and see where you stand or yeah. where we stand. Because if we don't need it, then I'm certainly, you know, I don't want it sitting in my bank account either. Well, I, I, by then, we would know more about the answer to the question of how much is the CAB spending on this as well. Fifty thousand in a six-month update. Yeah. Thank you. We also need to uh, affirm their one and a half percent increase for oh, their correct. their yeah. 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 yeah, historically we've been encouraging SBI to raise state fees incrementally. We've been doing a good job of that mm -hmm. years past. I recognize that's not as easy with a membership driven organization. Uh, OCCJ. So, we've got a couple things going on here. I uh, had conversation uh, about what Larry specifically you know, identified that we previously funded the or authorized the 233 as a match for their facility improvements and weren't able to secure the grant. So, the question was is that still available or if they're going in another grant cycle? And had conversations about we think we're so inclined we can make that happen uh, by way of encumbering or otherwise. Um, I would say they come back to you. Yeah, I'd say yeah. Back. I would say we did that a purpose specific reason. I, I would think that that two thirty three, if they have something else comes up, I would think they would need to come back to the commission. Yeah, I, I think the way that was originally done, 
they anticipated they wanted to make a grant application and they needed to, as part of that application, be able to indicate they had the local match and the 233 was a contribution to the local match. So we went off for grant and had this as the local match. It was basically for the same purpose, same grant process, just another round of it. Um, I, I understand your point, but I don't know that they're able to, they won't be able to go out and secure the grant and then come back and say, we got did the grant. They, did they apply for the grant or denied? That was my understanding, yeah. yeah. So did we give them the 233? No, we didn't. We, we, no, yeah, okay. we, we pledged it that if you're able to secure the grant and you need local match, that you know, they would contribute that much to the local match for the purpose of securing the grant. So I realize on some level this 233000 is theoretical money, but if we, if we opt not to carry forward that obligation, then I'm assuming that would come back to them, the general fund, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and help bolster that a little bit. Yeah, correct me if I'm but, wrong, but it's in the 2019 numbers. It's in the 2019 the budget, budget out of the general fund, so if it doesn't get spent, then it will stay in the balance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. On the flip side, if they come next year in 2020 and say, oh, we're ready to go, we haven't budgeted it, but we're going to have to find some place out of the general fund. Or we're going to put them out until 2021. Correct. Right. Correct. But I just don't like that sitting there. I could sit there another 12 months right. or two years. You know, I think we have to. If we did it for a specific grant request and that grant was not was not made available, then I think we step back. The next one could be for 150 thousand, or it could be for 300 thousand right. request. So, so it's the grant request is officially not going to happen. They're not still in a. Correct. Grant. That was my understanding that it was not going to happen in 2019. And that gives us a little bit of flexibility to it instead of having that money tied up uh, at a time when I think we might need it. So. Well, I'm trying to yeah. save you money, I'm Mayor. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. There are two different funding sources, sorry. Of course. <laughs> I hate all your buckets. <laughs> Just so we're clear, yeah. so because that, I know I'm going to end up having this conversation with OCCK, this approach would preclude them from applying for that same grant. Most likely, it would preclude them from applying in the 2020 grant cycle. Um, if they came back to you and said, we want to apply, we'd be scrambling around to find the 233, or we'd tell them, we'll, we'll factor it back. How come they didn't indicate that when they came to us? With their budget well, that made that they were going to, I mean, you know, they were going to. They did I, request us to hold it over. Right. They requested, they requested, did they say that they were going to apply for that in 2020? I think what I heard Pat say is they didn't get it this year. They like the opportunity to apply next year, and they were hopeful, and they just wanted to confirm that those funds would be available if they made that application. They would know by this time next year if they were successful. Yeah, I don't know the grant cycle exactly, but I presume so. Just if they know this year they weren't successful, so I assume they would cycle. So if they didn't get it next year. They would be at mid year bump back into the money. And if, if the money was. If, if they, they don't ask to try a third yeah, time. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if you look at sort of the low income housing tax credit program we have developers that, in all honesty, when I first, when we first started dealing with it, um, their characterization was you need to get your application in, or you just kind of need to get in line, and you need to be patient, and eventually they get funded. And it uh, came to pass that the league was. I don't know if this works that way or not, but that's kind of what OCCK is trying to request. I'm not having, and that's what I have I just, I, I want to be sure you're clear so we don't have a miscommunication when we communicate back to them. Well, if the project is being worth it, by itself, by a prior it permission, and then, yeah, authorizing the funds. Um, getting some high interest. Earning money for this one? Yes. <laughs> and commingle with all the other money that I can say is earning high interest. But my thought is that 233 rolls back into your general fund, which we're we're trying to build that up. And and if we've been successful and they come back, then we'd have to look at it and say, okay, we had that 233. They're coming back requesting it again, and we'll have to make that decision about where we're at. That's well, I mean, with the grant? 
you know, if they come back again to us, and, and they're going to have to come back and give us the steps and what they're applying for and, and the dollar amount. Or will they be applying for the same grant? I mean, that's what. Right. My, my understanding is they will, and completely understand that. I expect we'll go ahead and communicate that to them, and then they'll want to come back next week and, <laughs> and, and provide you that additional information. Which, if that's hopeful, we we'll can do that. Let's let them do it. Yeah. At least we know when the when they're applying for the grant when they find out. And, uh, and, and I'm not trying to argue yeah, with you. I, I just, just can see how this uh, whole conversation is going to play out. Um, so what I'm hearing is you would like more details on the project, the grant, the cycle. Um, that we're not meeting the expectation. And then I had jotted down on here on this bus and paratransit deal where they went uh, with the thirty-seven thousand three hundred forty. Dropping it back to the 2019 budget, and then by the time we take that 37342 off, I had 799618 or 799,000 instead of the 836960. And I came about that just a little bit differently too, Joe, because I was looking at just keeping it at the 2019 level. Yeah. So I think we're kind of on the same um, same. Page there, however, we get to that. But, it's uh, a little less because on the, that's why I had the fixed route, mm -hmm. they had a little more than they're asking for now. And, and, uh, Are you looking at the 2019 number? Yeah, compared mm -hmm. to 2019. I had to kind of fake those numbers because remember, as you recall, last year. <laughs> <laughs> she's not the first finance director. Last year you came in with some big number, and we said, well, no, it's not. We said, no, we're only going to do it at this level. So I just allocated those numbers to those proportionately, not what they had really, because we cut them back like 10% last year from what they requested. So I had to take that 811 and prorate it out to those two categories. So they may not be exactly where they would have put them, but that was just a proration based on the total they had requested prior. I guess the question is. So I wouldn't want to say this. I would look at the individual lines. I would look. At We'd look at the total. Right. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what we can do is <laughs> talk about those categories. I mean, do you have any opinion or direction about funding particular categories? Now we can kind of talk about that too. You got. Bus and paratransit services. 81 Connection was not funded historically, and we're asking for that. You got fixed route, uh, and then you got a nominal capital replacement. So OCCK is free to move funds from one category to another one. Well, uh, let me ask that as a question. We Are they solidify that our uses of our funds? Um, but have we ever yeah. asked? Have we ever audited that? And see Funds are dispersed according to their request. Okay, I'm aware of yeah. um, So to me, it's a lump sum, and they do what they kind of want. Okay. So the other question would be is there service request increasing? You know, this is getting close to almost you know, 66, 70% higher than it was four years ago. Mm -hmm. is, is there when, so right. giving out that much more service? When they added a route, they've indicated. Well, then it's the paratransit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, how much of that is your proportional allocation of the Their 20, the 2020 number is their allocation. Okay. So that number compared to five years ago would be an increase. That whatever that percentage is. Double. Even from 2018, that was their allocation. So from 2018 to 2020, that $43,000 is their allocation. So I want to know. Why wow, such a large increase? I mean, if, if it's if they can document the services are being requested and used, I'm going to face the harsh reality that a lot of people here in town need rides to get to us. Well, I'd like to know the true cost, cost of a ride. Yeah. And now we're not hearing numbers. That are, if I divide the numbers they've got for the bus service at the end of the drivership, it's about six and a half dollars a, a ride. And People are only paying a dollar a ride. I think Ms. Shea made some good points when she came and spoke to us in open session about people get on, they get off, get on. I'd like to know how many subscribers there are. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. I'd like a better understanding where money's going in. We give them, we're paying 30%, and they automatically get 
seven and a dollar they get them they get give them and they get two and a half dollars more from the federal government so they have every incentive to ask for more from their side because they'll see see the system working on budgetary saving so. when to that end there i know there's been conversations previously about uh, we talked about increasing the fare but uh, it has the effect of offsetting the payout and so again it doesn't so, work in, right, the, in the past they had there hasn't been all that much motivation to adjust the fares all that much to close the gaps. Could we say something like we wanted to hold the funding at the 2019 level and see the five uh, routes stay in place and then they have some discretion as to what they want to do, how, how they make that happen with the other services that they that, that are offered? Um, because, I mean, what I wouldn't like to see is if we do they hold them to that, the, yeah, to have them contract the services right. back to four routes or more limited hours. But if we could, you know, let them know that that was tied to maintaining the routes and the hours. Okay. So, if I hear what you're saying, hold them to the 2019 numbers, fixed route transportation is priority one and shouldn't contract. Mm -hmm. um, and if we, we want details on the grant application, we want details on cost allocation. Um, one other thing. And I'd like to know why they did increase, increase their right. infrastructure. One other thing that you might have noticed, they noticed it, they do something, they, they're providing um, uh, public transport in Abilene. And so I haven't really had a chance to talk with them, but I know there's administrative costs as part of the allocation that we pay for and KDOT pay for. I don't know if there's any might be some cost sharing of administrative costs with the third party uh, getting service funding, but I think that's a possible question as well. Because they should be saying the funds are that we don't want to turn it off. Yeah, I don't know the details I mean, of that yet, but if they are, then yeah, that might help yeah, offset I mean, some costs. That's what I do. And, you know, but it could be hazardous between our commitment to the <laughs> And it, admittedly, they have been increasing costs just like we do, so maybe that's helps them respond to us thinking that budget flat rather than giving them an increase. But. So, okay, I think I have an understanding of the additional information you'd like, but um, what do we do with them and bring that back? And we're staying at the 2019 request? Yeah, yeah, Municipal bank. Um, I, I believe historically, if not um, by ordinance or statute, we do have some obligation to the band to fund them in some fashion. So um, I just want to that roll that number over <laughs> year after year. Okay. Yeah. Well, they since I asked them if they could play when the governor comes. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, we're going to have to perform one of those wool suits this month. <laughs> uh, comprehensive fee schedule. Uh, that's a pretty broad topic, but we, we walked you through the comprehensive fee schedule in general. Um, you know, the, the big ticket conversation there for sure is, is uh, Mobile River Festival fees. Um, so that's one. The, uh, I know we have had some conversations individually and, and last week about the approach to parks and rec fees, and we can speak to that a little bit more. And then if you have any particular other concerns, we can talk about it. I'd, I'd suggest we kind of divide this question and make sure that you cover how you feel about Morgan Hill River Festival. Yes. I'm comfortable with the Smoky Hill River Festival adjustment. I mean, it's, up, it's overdue. Uh, I'd like to talk about the park and yeah. why we aren't making any adjustments there. Yeah. And also, what talking about the golf course fees and why that was taboo for the other night for the other day for some reason. Uh, and, and I didn't have a bet, but if we did, I would have owed you dinner. So, um, <laughs> 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 I'd like to hear three of them. I got the golf course fees, and I'm, I know you keep your hand on the pulse of other. Uh, festivals and stuff, and if you know, 
your agency is not nervous <coughs> about making that increase, uh, I guess you shouldn't be nervous. I what I would say, Mayor, is our, our uh, staff, the, the entirety of the staff, which surprised me a little bit, I would have been buying somebody dinner, Mike, uh, <laughs> um, is in support of this. Sees both the ration and uh, the rationale and, and the, the, you know, from our marketing person to our other support folks, um, there, there isn't any disagreement about that. What we would do to offset as best we could, there's always going to be a negative backlash anytime a price changes and especially after waiting 10 years. It just means that in terms of for the next uh, 11 months, our marketing is going to be taking on some messages about value uh, and, and price-wise, we're much like the city reflects some of its other budgetary decisions on sales tax, property, other things when we've gone through that and and uh, the city leadership has shown you all where Salina is in that. We tend to hover, hover near the middle or a little bit down below uh, the, the median and, and the festival price. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to compare with Wichita because I think we're a lot better than Wichita's festival. But, uh, um, but uh, I, I, I don't think we're pricing ourselves out of a market and it, an average of $5 a day is it's the best party on the planet. <laughs> Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you shared last week that what we observed the last time is volume of sales went down. Revenue didn't go backwards and then kind of grew. Revenue held, it, this is a larger increase, so the likelihood of having as much of a revenue loss as we had when we were only going from 7 to 8 and 8 to 10, um, uh, we'll probably see a um, uh, we'll see a, I, I would expect an uptick in revenue, even if we have an overall decline or, or check in, in sales um, for one year. But but I don't think it's going to move us backwards. I, I would be really <coughs> surprised. Yeah. One of my thoughts, and you might address it, is instead of going 10 and 15, what if we just went 15 for pre-sales and in regular sales with that? What would the thought process beyond that. I'm just trying to think about that jump to twenty dollars. Is that our biggest issue, or is it ten to fifteen to create the same issue? And then the other thing is, you might just address because I've worked the gate before. I think the the uh, going to twelve or thirteen dollars would be uh, would be hard to do just from a from a, <coughs> from a transaction standpoint. Uh, so. it, it would slow the length of time of each transaction when there's sales being made at each of those gates and uh, also increase the amount of, of, uh, of both security and others in doing cash transfers and replenishments at, at five locations. There, uh, we could work through that if we had to. Uh, again, if, if you decide on an amount somewhere in between, we, we just look at it as a problem to be solved and we have 11 months to get there and, and we could do that. But but um, in terms of the advanced sales, I'd be more nervous about losing uh, uh, the incentive to purchase early. Um, I uh, We do about 90% of our overall sales in advance. And and, uh, and and that incentive of that of that five dollar increment has worked well when we're at ten and fifteen. We'd like proportionally to keep that the same um, and uh, um, and and give people that encouragement to purchase their button early and, and have it prior to the weekend. And uh, yeah. Brad, you previously said that, that kind of is insurance against inclement weather. If we can get those pre sales going and Encourage people to buy before they size up whether it's hot or raining. A few, a few years ago, we used to sell buttons up until um, noon on Thursday uh, at the advanced price. And um, and what we're seeing with uh, uh, weather spotting and plan activities and others that people are are we're waiting until <laughs> that last minute to make a decision, and we fell off uh, when there was a forecast of rain every day. We had a couple, we had artists canceling the week of to, because they said, I've seen your forecast. Same with heat, but water and, and heat will cause people to make other decisions. And then, and then 
it never rained that particular weekend. Our gate sales went up some, uh, but uh, um, but it, it, uh, we just feel like that our attendance is stronger and and the business bulk of the revenue, the, the, the button sales represent 43% of the revenue for our festival budget each year. And, and I, I got a couple of email, well, I got a couple of emails, a couple of phone calls. Have you ever, I know you said something before about making a $10 Sunday have we have you thought about maybe doing the jam fest at a ten dollar uh, for the jam fest? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people I know that well, they said they love the jam fest, but they really don't care about the rest of the festival. I mean, is there a thought there that maybe doing something like that and increasing any any revenue out of something like that? We've and, and we've looked at everything from to, who's, who asked about the possibility, and I know we touched on it last week or the week before whenever we were dealing with this about a daily admittance like if you're right. only going to go to festival jam if you're only going to go on the sunday if there was a possibility of doing a risk a daily wristband the uh, uh we've been discussing wristbands for almost 15 years about whether that serves both as a security and and an access point that's any advantage or disadvantage and in terms of sharing and other things, probably not. You can put a wristband on loosely. You can slide it off and give it to someone else. You can cut it with, you know, scissors and retape it. And we don't have enough personnel to check every wristband coming in, unless it's RFID. And uh, um, uh, the uh, to go back to the daily thing, um, we did just briefly, and our our, our big staff debrief is next week we we'll spend three days kind of tearing it apart and saying okay what will work and what won't work and what do we change for next year and uh um the uh, uh, for instance a five dollar daily fee would be one possible solution uh and not do any advance sales and just collect money at the gate every day five bucks and and uh, assuming the average attendee from the survey data that we've gathered is two and a half days or so between two and a half and three days with three visits um, if we separated the jam out on thursday it would probably be an all cash transaction and it kind of sends a message that, that the jam isn't part of the festival whereas it took about 10 years to include the jam in the festival um, it's it's our most popular single night uh, of, of the of the year. And we we have about twelve to uh, eleven and a half to twelve thousand people um, in the park for food and music and community that night. And, and uh, it has had a disproportionate effect as that became more popular. Our Sunday attendance dropped, um, but uh, um, uh, but. But we haven't specifically explored a single admission for that event as a separate event. Um, uh, and so, how did you come up with the ten dollars over just Sunday alone? That's been a Sunday at the advanced price has been part of the festival history, I think, for thirty plus years. Okay. Uh, there's always been a, a and, and what was it? This is the first year I've noticed it wasn't on your approval. <laughs> <laughs> But but I guess since it fell within consistency of, of the advanced price, it wasn't it wasn't a lowering or a or a raising of, of costs on the last day. I, I don't know how that ever came into being, but it was never on the fee schedule. Uh, but we've always had Sunday as the advanced button price uh, for that one day. And again, as a reminder, um, there's no citizen is denied the opportunity to attend for inability to pay. Um, there, if you ever had bulk sales of the day, church group wanted to bring a hundred kids, but they said, "Whoa!" Well, we have the Thanksgiving family. That's everybody. <laughs> 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 um, we we haven't uh, the discounting buttons that would be something that we'd have to probably come back to you with, and, or make that as part of um, a schedule. But the short answer is no, we don't. Um, we. Uh, uh, we, we uh, our, our staff buys their own buttons. Otherwise, Natalie charges for you know, employee <laughs> uh, uh, benefit and uh, we'd have to pay taxes on the uh, button provider. So, but um, yeah, we, we strongly encourage the purchasing of buttons from staff to our volunteers. Our, um, uh, 
we, we do have some day passes for um, people who offer volunteer services, but wouldn't otherwise, they declare that they are, wouldn't otherwise attend the festival. Then we have a, a pass that allows them to come in or they wear their their organization's t-shirts to come in, perform their duty, and then they leave. And so um, we, we do all that we can to generate as many sales as we can. I did have a few questions that I, I received from, from folks too. Um, the first is, you're having your, your debriefing next week, but confirmation that we will not have any information on button sales or a profit and loss statement from the festival until September, is that correct? We'll know more before that, uh, Commissioner, but uh, um, the early indications are that uh, our button sales this year in the advanced end are um, similar to the last two years, uh, maybe slightly increased. We're, we're again, um, waiting on a couple of outside retailers, but, um, but that's going to hold fairly flat. We're up uh, about $9,000. Uh, I think the nice weather. Uh, made a difference on our gate sales. That's the most substantial increase of, of on-site sales that we've had in a long time. Um, we, we began a few years ago aggressively marketing the advanced sales of buttons. And what we saw was an increase of advanced sales and employee purchase, uh, em, employer purchasing of buttons. But then we saw a proportional decrease at the gate. So, so um, having the gate sales increase this year, I think, the tournament at the field house made a difference on some of those attendees and a couple of other events uh, through airport authority and, and national guard or, or military things and others uh, made it made a difference and the nice weather um, but, uh, and it's kind of interesting you talked about you know people being able to look ahead at the forecast and make their plans um, based on that and how that impacted advanced sales i would wonder also what a button cost of twenty dollars would do to someone who just decided spur of the moment, I'm in line at a tournament at the field house, I'm gonna go, or I thought I was gonna be out of town this weekend, but now I'm gonna go. And I mean I think that there's you know, a twenty dollar button is I mean, you know, it's it, it's obviously more expensive. And then um, donor participation trends. Do we have any information on um, how like private support for the festival? Um, has, has been going in terms of helping us offset these uh, button increases? Yeah, the, the only reason we probably haven't come to you earlier is because of uh, private support uh, growing. Uh, before coming to the citizens or to the, um, to the general public to say, hey, we need your help or we need you to take a larger part, we, um, uh, we annually we secure $150,000 worth of in-kind services for the business and private community, uh, including hotel rooms and food and uh, professional labor and supplies and materials. And then we also received uh, approximately budgeted uh, for about $150,000 in, in cash donations um, uh, in support of the, of the River Festival. So um, those trends have um, slightly increased. We've gone up about $25,000 annually in cash donations uh, and about $50,000 in in-kind over the last 10 years. Okay, and so the, the cash donation hasn't declined? No, it has okay. not. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, and then something that you said earlier kind of um, caught my attention in terms of with the increase in attendance <coughs> on um, Festival Jam night, you've seen kind of a corresponding decrease on Sunday attendance. Yes. And have, has it ever been considered to not have Sunday to eliminate, and that's, or the elimination of, say, like a Bravo stage or something? I'm just trying to think of other ways that, you know, we could somehow, to me, the, the, the leap from $10 to $15 is a, is a, is a pretty big increment. Um, yeah. It is, and, and, uh, and I mean, as a percentage of it, certainly to go up 50% in a, in a given year is, is a large increase. Um, not going up for the last 10, and probably not going up for the next five to seven years, at least till the 50th year of the festival, where we may want to reevaluate again. This gives us 
this catches us up where we were and it gives us a little bit of a cushion to be able to move forward so that we're not adjusting price in demand is substantial. I mean, in terms of employee time, public works time, wages, benefits, other things that, that haven't been, I mean, the city's proportion of an in-kind contribution has gone up considerably over the last 10 years without a corresponding increase of revenue. And so- um, a financial contribution as well. Yes. It help offset that. Yes. What's I mean, the well, the, the our age, well, I don't know whether you <laughs> want to try this or, or, or me, Mike, but our, because we're not, in, because Line Arts and Humanities Fund or, or the agency fund is separate from the general fund, annually we've been budgeted with salaries and other things at kind of a fixed amount for a number of years, but without a corresponding increase of revenue either from the city to reimburse or for us to have the opportunity to earn more money so that so that the city doesn't um, uh, have to uh, uh, prop up the agency fund. We, we, we've hit our projected income streams and we've hit our projected or, or our budgeted expenses or, or have been under that, but, the, but our salaries and benefits and other things has kind of held the same for a number of years without a corresponding increase of revenue from any other source other than festivals. And so um, uh, it, uh, 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 this, if, if we stay as a separate agency uh, under, under the city, it would give a larger cushion to kind of help balance those increases over time as well. So, so so arts and humanities doesn't function as a regular city department like public works <coughs> or um, uh, yes and no. They they are a standalone department, but there's also uh, fund accounting as it relates to the river. The festival. museum fund is funded under the general fund, and arts and humanities and the river festival are funded under the arts and humanities fund, and that fund is supplemented from the general fund annually. Amounts ranging from five hundred thousand to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars over the last three or four years. And is that difference between the 500 and the 650, is that attributable to variations in festival income? Or um, what are, I guess? Festival income, festival expenditures, right. just budget, okay. and arts and humanities, arts budget humanities in general. Arts and humanities programming, arts and humanities expenditures, but all of those that they're, that they're covering, that are kind of covering. Okay. Our, our income has varied some with the festival like last year on a, on a heat year um, uh, we had uh, uh, a decline in overall food sales of about uh, I don't 40 40 or forty five thousand dollars or something and 18 percent of that supports the festival and and so we took a hit there and we had uh, uh, slightly big with the forecast um, a slight decrease in button sale and uh, uh, our luckily our expenses I mean as far as our fiscal year we finished within uh, what the city didn't benefit of that money coming into the general fund but from the agency side we stayed under we, we had about a two thousand dollar positive cash flow in the operation of the business because of lower than expected expenses but the city didn't benefit yeah. from that Right. City took the heat and 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 came in to supplement um, some of that that otherwise would have just stayed with the agency. So it um, it's it's a little bit awkward at best to kind of have have the department functioning as a fund, and I think that was established um, back when the when the city no longer gave the money annually to the Arts Commission to manage and operate, and, and they weren't sure how to, uh, and, and also how to do some carryovers within the agency fund uh, for uh, um, for grants and, and for the festival, <coughs> festival's fiscal year being different than the city's fiscal year, so. Okay, probably just a couple last things real quick, and thank you for your patience um, on this, but I wanted to make sure I worked through all these so I could get people answers. Um, it was brought up to me several times that the River Fest in Wichita, and I know you don't want to compare that, but that's what people in the community yeah. do. Um, for the nine-day festival, it's $10 for adults and $5 for children. 
Um, and there were a couple of other festivals that were referenced to me that I'm not familiar with that were entirely free. So I think that um, just so you're aware that there is conversation in the community about whether or not citizens are seeing good value. And I'm not advocating that they are or they are. I, I mean, I think it's a great value. I, I, I do. But that's the conversations that, that are out there in terms of if I buy my $10 at Riverfest, I've got nine days worth of, of things to, to be doing. Um, and then the other thing was, and this relates to something that Mayor Day, awfully, I think it would be awfully positive if we could be looking at button bundles in terms of whether that goes two for 25 or three for 35 or something like that so that there is some incentive not only to purchase early, but to purchase in bulk. Because, um, you know, I, I, I still think a 50% increase is, is on, on, on button sales in one year is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just having a hard time That's feeling, supported, feeling supportive of that. I've written down numbers, you know, <laughs> one for 15 and two for 25. Uh -huh. uh, people will spend money if they think they're getting a bargain. Whether they need what they're buying or not, they're just wow! Look at this great coat I just bought for eighty percent off. Yeah, but you spent a thousand dollars. But look at what I saved. But you don't need a new coat, but I got a great bargain. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, right or, or the family who has four teenagers over the age of eleven. Is beige happen to be in town and at the uh, field house and show up? That's going to be eighty dollars. Kids. Or parent, that's going to be $120 for the family. Doing, doing tiered pricing um, inventory wise would be difficult with, with 60 locations because if we send buttons out, we don't know whether they've sold those at the single button price or multi button prices or whether they sell lots of packages but then only reimburse or, you know. Uh, sell a lot of singles and then reimburse us for multiple suites. There's there's a number of, uh, of issues with that unless unless package or bulk pricing was done online only and and the the agency had a had a date uh, and we already have online button orders that we send. Do, do we have a lot the of theft from our um, our presale vendors? No. Um, our overall, our um, our presale inventories are pretty pretty tight, um, but we do sign with our two largest retailers. We sign an agreement that says, you know, if, they, if they've made an accounting error or mistake, that we're not going to hold them liable for the free service that they're offering. And, uh, and we haven't had problems with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just looking no. at some of the places that they're on sale, and I mean, I, you know, they, they seem like well, there's more pretty trusty right now because if I give you 50 buttons, mm -hmm. I want that amount of money back. Right. In Whereas if you start bundling, I have no yeah. idea how much money I can get yeah. back. So there's a certain amount of accountability that people realize that they have that is being held to, which helps. Right? You always bundle online, pick them up at the gate. Yeah. What percentage are returning festival goers. I mean, how many, do you have a way to track who's new at the festival attending each year? I'm guessing the same people that go to the festival are, are you know, 90% of your date. And oh. if you started bundling, you'd, you'd just be giving people an opportunity to, to slash your revenues. It, uh, uh, we don't have that specific data, but in terms of our, uh, I was a little depressed about that over a number of years because we were aggressively marketing and trying to increase revenue before asking to increase revenue through the button sale. And uh, um, and we held the same. Interestingly, what I didn't see until about two years later, the national trends for attendance at festivals was declining at the same time we were kind of holding our own. Uh, that stabilized and is slightly going up now. But uh, uh, to go back to your point, Commissioner, on Wichita, um, it, it is really, uh, Wichita's had a lot of problems in terms of cash flowing their festival at the price. They lost 80 or 
hundred thousand dollars two years ago. They, um, uh, I haven't seen numbers from 2018 or this year. Um, uh, but in a 10 day event, there's only two days that there's an art show, uh, up until two years ago, that button didn't get you anything. You had to pay extra for the boat races, extra for the music, extra for certain events. There were, there were ticketed venues and the buttons were just a, a little bit of a revenue generator to help the festival, but it never did. To the best of my knowledge, it still has a cash flow and it's heavily subsidized, uh, from from other sources, and so um, the, uh, uh, the kind of non-commercial nature of this, and the, both the safety, security, attention to detail, the cleanliness, and the quality of the services that are offered, um, uh, are some of what that visitor experience is that we strive for to be the best we can. And so, for the folks who've grown up here, and this is all they've ever seen in a festival, and think they're all like this, um, they're not. Uh, it's a uh, but I do. It, I, I will acknowledge it's a lot of money, and we'll do whatever the majority of you direct us to do. Commissioners, okay. if you are going to make adjustments, whether it's bundling or, or a jam fest uh, single pricing, you thought that was going to cause a decrease in revenue. Having that correspond with increased rates might help offset some of that. But it's, uh, uh, I guess, pun intended. This is more art than science in terms of estimating these numbers. There, there is an economic concept of price elasticity where you can actually calculate it, but uh, we don't have enough data to actually make that calculation in my mind. So would it be kind of a feel of what feels right and what we think might be some of it? Well, without some kind of bundling, I'm just across the board, 10 to 15 and 15 to 20, I just, it's a, it, it's a non-starter for me unless we could get to some sort of uh, bulk purchasing option. No offense, Commissioner, but I'll cancel that one. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I think, think I'm it was, under, I'm, it was yeah. worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, it should have been done prior. I don't, I don't think that that extra five dollars for all the festival people that I'm acquainted with. So the 600 people we surveyed, which statistically is is a valid number, that almost 50 percent, 48 percent, had said they'd pay a minimum of five dollars more. That gave me a great confidence that that people willing to pay five to 15 dollars more for the same event or to maintain the quality and and uh, uh, continue to improve the event. If half of our public responding was willing to pay that minimum that we're asking for, then I, that gave me a lot more confidence to come back to this body uh, and say, I think we can weather this. I think we can do it. It's not a, we, we still have a large number of folks who qualify for free and reduced lunches and, and not everyone else is getting a 50% increase in their, you know, uh, ticketed uh, venue. So I, I don't want to make light of it, but, uh, um, but uh, uh, I, I do feel like we have some strong supporters out there too. Um, something I'm, you know, if somebody's in town for one day, I mean a bunch of kids, it would be nice to see five dollars for the one day. Well, under 11 they get in free anyway, or 11 and under. So if the teenager is going to be there for one day, five dollars a day. They want to come three days more, you may end up getting 15 anyway. Um, well, the compromise for the tier tonight, I hate saying this without the staff here, I'd love to be able to go back and let them put holes in it and kind of explore it as well. But, um, you know, it, the, the other affordable option for those folks who are only coming for one day, or to go to your point, uh, Commissioner Hodges, um, a $10 one day pass, no button, just a one day pass, a stamp on your hand. You can come and go till you sweat the stamp off, but you know it's it's you know that that might be an alternative for folks who are are waiting for that single time could mean a revenue loss on some things on a dance, but most of our regular attenders come more than once and um, and would still probably want a button uh, as opposed to running the thought of paying ten on Thursday, ten on Friday, and ten on Saturday. Uh, but um, 
that is that that is something that could probably be managed at the gates with a single transaction on a one day fee. Yeah. Yeah. Table and come back in three minutes, or do you want to just watch through it now? Well, there's a contested court slide. Um, I'm okay with the 15 20 for the individuals that use it for the weekend. Um, I don't like Brad's idea of the $10 for a one day stamp or something. I, I Again, logistically, you got to think through all this, you know, working the gate and everything, you know, because that gate can get fairly busy and you're trying, you got somebody trying to count, you got somebody making change, then you're going to have to be stamping. So it's, you know, it gets labor intensive uh, trying to do that. But I, again, I think the bundling is a great idea, except I think the accounting of it um, would be a, the only place I could see them really doing the bundling is if they wanted to order them through the office. You know, that would make some sense. But I think. The merchants doing that, or somebody else might be able to be able to. So, run the people fifteen twenty. Or about two and a half, two and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, I'd like to see the bundling work in some form or fashion. And uh, so, I guess I thought ten dollars a day was going to be. You know, adults who are coming, they're, they're going to. And my, it's bringing the kids in. Uh, if they're here and they go to a movie, what are they going to do? Kids 11 and under are free, else. by the way. I mean, just as a reminder. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't be telling you how to run your business, but I can see the desire to keep it simple. Yeah. And that's kind of how we got into this problem. Yeah. We uh, don't want to fool with cash. And if you go to a stamp system, uh, it seems to me, then you're right back with a lot of logistics and I realize you've got so many volunteers there. I mean, that, that takes more people to manage that. I mean, more volunteers. And probably not an upward trend on the volunteer side of it either. So I would I guess I'm just gonna stand and take the advice of somebody ahead of it and get in the request and see how it plays out. You so always go to and, and if, it, and if we see a significant Line, there's nothing that keeps us from going back to the 10 and 15 next year, correct? As long as as long as we know by um, early August of each year when we print our first documents for uh, promotion, you'll, you'll know. Um, yeah, by this time next year, yeah. We can go to 15, 20. It, one alternative would be to indicate your support for that pricing and ask the staff to consider you know, bundling some of these options when they debrief and. Report back to the county and it's logistically uh, possible. But you know, it would at least be communicating the intention for the fee and then if there's any offsetting. An additional option to sell it. Yeah. Option. Like, you know, when, when teenagers and kids go in, it's not just the admission price. They're going to eat $35 of fee a day each if they're there for two hours. Well, that guy with the ball that, game, cause, uh, he's going to have to bring a fat pocket. Right. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, and that's what the real money is. Right. When, but unfortunately, I don't know that we have enough statistics to say whether our, the bulk of our uh, uh, patronage is from people that are intentionally going to the festival and how much of that is kind of spilled over here in town anyway. Um, I, I have to think that it's kind of the ancillary that's probably even a significant that contributor, but that's all anecdotal. Can't say that I've seen. Well, as a parent of an, a traveling athlete, you know, generally they don't generally change out of uniform all day long. They're in a uniform, and I can't say I've seen a lot of kids in uniforms at the Rainbow Festival. All right, I will go with the collective wisdom of the group. Okay. okay. So, yeah. The topic is still kind of fees in general. That, that's one. Joe, you mentioned uh, golf course fees, but Chris and I had a chance to talk, so you would. <clears throat> well, you know, before you get there, I mean, the way I look at it, I mean, it's just like if you uh, if, if you're renting if you're renting someplace and the guy fixes up the house and fixes up really everything else, you've got to raise your rent. We're putting one we're putting one and a half million dollar system in at the golf course out there. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't free. 
So, I mean, you know, we got people playing it. I mean, they, that's what they want it for. I think they need to, I need, think they need to increase the uh, fees of the golf course. I mean, you know, we don't want to go ape on it, but I mean, they, I do think they need to be increased. We, we have the ability to increase fees up to 10% without coming to the city commission. So, I can, we can look at whatever is desirable, um, but we have that latitude. You said you went back and looked and I did do a fee increase? Yeah, with the, with the, when we talked last time, I was thinking about fees that had to be approved by the city commission. Um, we are allowed to go up 10% um, without, without that we just submitted it for part of the budget process. We have increased some fees, about 4% um, over the last couple of years, but we didn't want to get in a situation where we did. I, before I got here, there was a big public outcry when we raised the, the golf fees. And yeah, well, that was that was like eighteen to twenty percent. Yeah, and we didn't want to get in that mode again. No, I, but, I'm not talking about going wild with it, but I think they need. I think we need to supplement that a little bit. We're putting a, a brand new water system in out there, and it needs to be paid for. I mean, so I mean, increasing the the fees. Uh, so, so we don't and get just, to just a twenty percent increase <laughs> in another right. three or four years. Well, I, I think last week you raised the question of whether we raised fees last year and. When, when is the last time we raised fees? We haven't raised, raised, well. We raised them in 2019, according to my. Right. 4%, 4.8%, some of them 4.7%. Yeah, sorry, so I mean, I knew they raised them. The commission didn't raise right, fees, right. but you guys raised right, fees. Right. Because I know we took a lot of, we took a lot of heat from a lot of the seniors out there, but, you know, it, it, it equivalent to a, a buck, I think it was, or even yes. less than that. I mean, but, no, that's why I, I, I kind of got the idea that, you know, when it was brought up last week, it was kind of a voodoo subject, and I mean, it's a... Yeah. Where are they compared to course number 59? I have that question written. It's the line of courses. I mean, acknowledging that you're only playing at Great Line or the Country Club if you're members of those. Well, you'd have to compare us to Turkey Creek and the first thing. Egg Hill and Manhattan, probably. And, uh, I don't know how we compare to those. I can pull that together. And Heston, those are probably the big ones. So, so, yeah, I don't know. Be comparable as far as driving distance to play. Chris mentioned it, but just so we're clear, it, we're, we're kind of in a unique situation in that by resolution we adopted the park pricing uh, cost recovery policy and then authorized staff and to administrators of set rates. So, we have the opportunity, as he described, up to a percentage to go ahead and set those without coming back and amending the, the fee schedule. So what I'm hearing you say is in light of our investment and taking into account your courses and communities, you don't you, you want to want the staff to revisit that fee schedule. Well I guess my question was when we, when we got the fee schedule, and that's what I asked you, I noticed that the parks and rec hey. information wasn't in here and that's when you explained to me about the cost recovery. So I, it'd be interesting to see that schedule, even though we're not looking to, to make an adjustment. I, I'd like to see it. But I think in all departments that have the ability to adjust their fees, they need to look at it on a regular basis so that we're, you know, incrementally you know, moving that rate up a little bit so we don't get into that, you know, kind of like we are. And again, River Festival Club is a little tougher because of the way we collect, but you don't want to get into that 50% jump. You'd rather have that 2 and 3% you know, bump over time, it's a little less painful when it happens, even though you get the same benefit, you know, for a long period of time. So, so that, that was my yeah. only. Are you requesting a copy of the, what the actual fees are or what, how we calculate them? Are you proposing just the cost adjustment? recovery plan or what um, we actually have in place? What we have in place, probably, from the parks. And, and maybe kind of like you did on this one the last time they were changed. And, and some of that may even be for, you know, a, a shoulder house rental and that type of stuff. And I don't, I don't know what we've done with fees at the, at the water park over time. That'd be nice to see too. I mean, I, those type of things. And just as a related issue, do we know if the fees for tennis and gymnastics have bumped up in instance? Programs move to Genesis. I don't know the fees. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's, yeah that'd be good. That, that, that's important for us to know. Because yeah. we, there's a maximum limit, not limit, but the gymnastic fees can go up for the first couple of years. For the recreational program. Recreational, recreational right. not, the, yeah. not the club ones. There's a lot more fees in the comprehensive fee schedule, but anything of the, the only one I noticed, and I, and I noticed a lot of the municipal court fees didn't increase. Is there a reason that those have, that those stay fairly stagnant? I know we don't set yeah, those. Right. The Some jail is full when we can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know the judge is mindful of kind of yeah. combined yeah, costs. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's mindful of combined costs and fee and court costs and then kind of collection rate. Right? So the, the items that are discretionary in the part of the judge uh, are we proposing the change. We had a conversation about we're not necessarily proposing the change in this either, but the things that are within your discretion, the court administrative fees, we're looking at those in terms of your communities. First pass, we just looked at the actual court fees, but we want to look at, for example, citation combined costs and how we compare it. But, uh, I don't want to put the judge on the spot, but she has, I think you know, that has uh, an independent discretion on the judge. I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're, are you, because you're using the term fees, and to me that probably means something mm -hmm. different than it does to you. Well, there are other fees here, though, but there are clients. When I go back here and I look at, uh, um, so, sorry, I want more support of you, I lost my page. Um, <coughs> Like on our, it says on the municipal court, but it's parking violations, parking zone, you know, a licensed driver. A lot of those, you know, there was there was no change. Do you change those very often? I mean, are those remain fairly stagnant over time? I think the fine scheduling, the fines, which is what you're talking about. Those would be, about. Be, be a fine. Right. Sorry, they're, yeah. they're on the fee <laughs> schedule, but it's the they're fine that the court imposes. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, those were last revised, I think, in 2016, possibly 2017, is the last time that they were increased. So I do review those periodically, and as Mike was saying, we did a study just looking at the court costs, which is what the governing body said, comparing to other communities. But other communities also interpret that differently. And a part of what we collect court costs is simply the state court. What would you pay if you got a speeding ticket for going 10 miles an hour over? So it's not really an apples to apples comparison. And there's a lot of variation. You know, if you are in Johnson County, you can get a speeding ticket in Lenexa and pay a lot different than you would pay if you were in Overland Park two blocks away. I mean, you know, uh, it's all at the discretion of the court and then the governing body to set the court cost. So we have. From my perspective, we did not look at this as a revenue source, as, and I'm sure the judge that wasn't our motivation as, as much as... Kind of a cost recovery. <laughs> I, I was describing it more as just kind of best management practices in comparison to our peers that we weren't you know, out of step. But, um, and we may have discussed it last week, but there's, there's a very noticeable uh, correlation, at least it appears to be a correlation, between PD staffing and their ability to conduct traffic revenue more so than fine uh, amount. But so we kind of said that's a task. Well, and it looks like um, most of these were um, revised and increased in March of 2017. So, you know, haven't been. Yeah. Um, and, it, I mean, yeah. Well, if you, if you see two, they're been all been. very round numbers. Yes. That, yeah. You know, if you apply a percentage, it'll be. $220, $250.87 or something you know, versus kind of trying to do in round increments. Um, I don't want to move too quickly. I, I know we talked about landfill fees uh, last week and, and some of those number dollar wise. Uh, we have a lot of categories for tires and different kinds of tires, but I think there's probably some reasons for that passing through some of our disposal expenses. Um, Anything else? So what you know? I still have an issue with is the curbside recycle. <laughs> well, fair enough. We're yeah. still charging 550 and it costs us 
uh, we have the drive through facility that you know, we're coming up on a year. I, uh, I recently reported, and uh, we, I don't know what the off the top of my head, but we've identified in a study session to revisit this whole conversation again in light of uh, fee changes for disposing of recyclables in the season. And so uh, and we, we've kind of put together, whiteboarded, and outlined topics we need to cover with you. And, I should have read it again this, this morning, but I should remember that date. I think September, September. Oh, they remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 is that something you think should wait until we get to that? Well, and we certainly can cover it at that point in terms of our actual cost for curbside recycling and our and what we're charging. And I think a lot of the information that we're going to prepare present then addresses the bigger picture of where's recycling headed and where's fee headed at. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think Mayor Davis characterized it correctly quite some time ago, and it, it's it's turning into uh, how do we feel about it as just a policy decision, moral imperative, more so than a cost break even scenario. And, and unless the markets turn themselves around or something drastic with the drive through facility, I, I still have that issue. Or we're, sure. we're way, way under, under collecting, and now we're paying for. for I think the numbers bear all that out. Yeah, we're, I, think, I think we're going to have a handful of options for consideration about alternate locations, alternate alternate ways to handle our recyclables. That kind of thing. Well, it's going to exist in the budget now. No, but it, you know, we try to do conference fee schedule once a year, but nothing prevents us from going back and making an adjustment. And typically, um, we make an effective January one. So, if if coming out. It's, just, it's, a thorn, it's a thorny, complicated topic. And forgive me, because I know you referenced this in your city manager's update. What are we going to, what are we, given our present volume of recyclables that we take down the street, mm -hmm. what are we looking at in terms of monthly fees that we will need, be needing to pay to Stutzman in we, order to. We think to our added cost is about $3,500 a month. $3,500 a month. So we think, you know, in terms of we calculated that number and took that into consideration as what we're targeting a date to bring it to you in study session, okay. just to kind of verify it's affordable. And then, um, but tipping, fee, tipping fees alone for recycling are now exceeding our landfill fees that we charge to pick up uh, refuse of, of the landfill. That's what we, we, we say it costs us um, <coughs> curbside recycling to buy right. it. it, it and we have 817 that. customers. 817 today. customers. So yeah, that's about like about 12,000 for us. I, I, as I said a year and a half ago, I was for dropping curbside recycling with the, with the other opening up. Well, we, so in all honesty, you know, we hadn't talked it through previously. We, we thought we were. Uh, and carrying forward what we talked right. about before, I don't disagree with your point, but yeah. we're almost into a, a broader policy yeah. discussion yeah. than a fee adjustment. Um. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, um, capital improvement program. Uh, two things here. Uh, you know, we've gone through the capital improvement program itself, and as as I itemized the $37.8 million worth of projects, I included capital improvement program on, on that list as well. I think I explained it before, but the reason I put that on that list was trying to raise the question of you of whether you're satisfied with kind of the annual amount that we have available to allocate to capital improvement projects. What I think I heard from your responses was at the moment we're going to make do with our annual allocation. So, that, that's the case on that question, then we're down to you know, the individual projects for 2020 and going forward. And uh, carrying forward the, the hike and bike trails, uh, the park uh, capital improvement plan, and, and we are trying to, well, we have a targeted date for a study session to go over the priority list. My thinking there is um, I want to get those priorities set so that we're not having a project by project discussion about what to spend the annual allocation on. And we're, working our way through our list in, a, in an appropriate order. Street enhancements programs, um, that is a reduction to try to balance the budget and 
help the general fund reserve balance. Um, all told, this is just one item of the overall street budget. All told, we're still spending five and a half or million uh, on, on street improvements. Smoky Hill River uh, construction phase one. Um, you know, we we did the sales tax uh, renewal and, and increase in 2016, and we. Plan at that point, and continue to do the plan, is to take the debt service that will mature for Kenwood Cove and, and reapply it to the river. And so, Mark Pastor, who uh, didn't, didn't see a 130 study session coming and has another commitment that should be here shortly, is managing to that number. And there's a lot going on there in terms of design fees, uh, trying to pursue significant grant funding from the Corps of Engineers and the state. That type of thing. It, that's all going to be managed to that number. So the phasing just kind of flows out of cost estimates and design considerations. So this is getting started on phase one. Um, and I know the, the next item, the Ohio to the YMCA trail, there's been some discussion about the details of that and, and its priority. But um, and I may have misspoke. This is just the trail. It does not address the, the choke point from the Ohio Street from that box culvert. But, Trying to maximize um, grant funds from the state, and recognizing that's still a significant contribution on our part. But it, it's a trail section that um, should terminate at the YMCA parking lot, but it just doesn't. You know, the trail the diag out midway has got a uh, starting point and an ending point. Um, Smoky Hill River and Old uh, Water Storage. I think we talked about that previously. North Bank Street, we talked about that one. Tony's Pizza Event Center basketball floor replacement. That's been something that we you know, identified and tried to fund for quite some time. It's nearing, nearing if have not have passed the end of its useful life. It's not very labor intensive in terms of setting it and picking it back up and uh, their ability to host events um, could be impacted by that floor. Um, Replacing a quint for the fire department. I think you had a CIM or something about our vehicle equipment uh, schedule and, and fire department. And the self contained breathing apparatuses uh, are essential to the fire department. They uh, have achieved their uh, expected useful life. Waterline improvements that's that $2 million a year that we've been doing and, and continuing. Uh, wastewater treatment plant design is all in anticipation of the need for renovation. And, Modification of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, that's essentially the 2020 portion of the CIP. Do we have a guess at what the wastewater treatment plant will cost? So, when it is redesigned? It's either 32 or 28 million. I can't remember. I think it was in my mind. 32 yeah. is the. No, that's the, the south water plant. So it's 28. I know the two numbers. It's about 60 between the two. And what about the timing expenditure? Is it like the seven million for the construction phase? Is this you know, early in 2020 or later in 2020? Um, well, again, without Barbara here, I know she's finalizing the design. We'll have to put it out to bid, but uh, most likely we'll at least be issuing debt in 2020 for that, whether it's interim or temp notes or long term financing. So I think at a minimum, it'll, that authorization will fall in 2020. Allocated so, that make that out. so the sales tax was passed to help with the river festival, but depending on how that comes uh, in, yeah, it looks like Brett's up. So. Yeah. Yeah. River Brett, yeah. yeah. what did I say? River festival. festival. <laughs> <laughs> Seven million for River <laughs> Festival, Brad. Right. Have a good time, Mr. Hyde. Your wife's not going to be I may have a hard time. Can I stay with you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. You've been all along. Um, the, the river project. So. So we're collecting funds to do this. Depending on where we're at as far as collections, it's going to help us decide as to what, how much of a phase we can do at a time. Well, how are we going to, how are we going to monitor that and, and right. stay within well, what, what our sales tax budget would do for us? We we've taken the annual appropriation for um, the Kenwood Cove debt, right? Identified when that's going to mature, and we won't have to pay that anymore. And then we projected essentially the net present value of that payments came, and Martha's going to have to manage the design cost and phasing the scoping of okay, that, that okay. identified dollar amount, plus whatever we were able to secure in terms of core uh, participation, data grants, and things like that. 
So uh, another way to put that is the scope is going to have to be managed in response to the budget rather than the other way around. Through the debt service. Right. When will we have, and I realize this is a question that should be asked to Mark, of Martha, but when are we going to have an answer from the core? I mean, we've been talking yeah. about it for quite a while, and I think, I think there she is. Yeah. She's just going over the right <laughs> she she just kept on going. Yeah, yeah. 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 bye. <laughs> um, I, I think we've had conversations about that. We have all, and we have positive indications from the core about the willingness to participate. At the moment, uh, the timing slowed down a little bit. They're a little distracted by flooding and the response to that. So Martha hasn't been able to. Um, and it hasn't even said, felt appropriate yeah. to really test them about that right now. But Martha, the question was sense of course participation in the river project. But, but do we have a, a timeline for when they're anticipated maybe to, to make a decision and what their commitment, what their financial commitment would look like? I mean, I know we've kind of talked about $10 million and we'll just assume it, that it's going to go okay, but I didn't know if we had... If you had a sense of when the hard and fast, yes, we're going to we're going to commit to it. They're committed in for the feasibility study right now. They have four hundred fifty thousand in that, and we have three hundred fifty thousand total of eight hundred thousand. And they're have sent um, out to the consultants to send back their RF. Keys. No, not key. I think it's Q. I don't think they're asking any numbers, but the Q for their qualifications to select the person that's going to do part of the work for them and the core will do a good share of that feasibility study. So the feasibility study is the first step to get that done and I think they're working on it now at least the date for that the RFQs to come in were at the end of July so they're back on it. They, um, I think Mike was talking about flooding and I've been didn't think I was mean enough or big enough to call them up and complain about my project when they're dealing with levees from Nebraska all the way through and problems. So they are working on it now. And then, you know, other than what we've learned in the past, once they get this far into the project, they have always been successful. The $10 million won't come all in one fatal swoop or one time. So we're looking at... No, it won't be a phone. Big, might, might be like three phone board checks, you know, but it's set up to come in different uh, phases. And we work with them and we'll continue to work with them to make that phasing make sense. But, um, Martha, you, you might also speak to kind of their limiting purpose of what they feel they want to fund and participate in. It's not the river project in its breadth as we see it as much as their core. And they've done when the water was transferred. Um, out of the city and the bypass channel. So most of the work they will do will be the influence where we sediment control, we're moving the sediment, and all of the what I'll call natural areas where they'll uh, be trying to put the ecosystem back, whether it's fishing, bird watching, and all of that will be their part of the work. In the park areas and at uh, Fourth Street and Iron, the more urban type areas, they won't be participating in that, so no funding in that. So we think a first phase of the project, I have to go back out to the public and review this with them, but could possibly be the pilot channel to move the water. Um, and I call it a wow factor at that, at Iron and Fourth Street, which you've seen some of the renderings for that. And then uh, maybe some additional trails at some point, but it really kind of depends upon exactly what cost estimate is for all of these pieces and what property we may have to acquire. With the drawings that HDR is completing, we'll have uh, the limits of construction so we can define um, what right away or access easements, whatever we might need to be able to do the project and, and select the work. And then after that, it will be more of a combination of phases to bring in the core's money to do their part of the work as it becomes available. It's kind of a snapshot of how we see things going forward. Right. So once the, the RFQs are received at the end of July and you select the vendor for the feasibility study or whatever, how long would that take to complete? I and think then, it's about a year. A year. Give or take. And then at that point, the core is going to determine its level of in, involvement. Yeah. And from or all responsibility the, or the discussion, you know, the $10 million is really 
you know, there's a lot more work than that to be done. But for the size of project, small project that we're signed up, that's the dollars available. <laughs> so don't see any reason that that funding wouldn't be there. It's just a matter of time is how long it's going to take. And no one seems to want to venture a guess on how quick the money might come from the core. But there are projects being done currently with that same type of money. And uh, so we, I, I like to say that we feel pretty positive about it, but you know, a lot of things can happen and change right. that. And I guess I kind of, my question is, do we start on different aspects of, of the project until we know we have that, that funding source secured and what exactly that they're willing to cover? I, I guess I'm just worried that all of a sudden we get like, say, $7 million into the project and we realize we're not going to have um, what we thought we were going to for the core, or it's not going to become available for longer, or whatever, and then it, what happens? We we promised to try to get the water flowing in. With the pilot channel, we can we can make the water flow. It might not be as wide a river channel as we're looking for, and um, some aesthetic value downtown and that, and uh, then we can have better costs. We don't know exactly what the core's idea of ecosystem, um, what they'll propose as their part of the project, but uh, everything we've got from them is positive. They they don't see any issues with it not being a, a viable project that they'll find. Well, and I think Commissioner Ryan asked a question before you got here, and I think they kind of can relate in that he was asking about the timing of if the $7 million allocation is made, when, when construction would commence, and what that timing might look like. And that kind of factors into when when we'll know something from the core and make commitments about our expenditure. Those are those really we don't want to go out and start on the project till we have worked with the core and know what their project is going to be because they might say, well, you really don't need us anymore. You have water flowing, right. so we're kind of a chicken and an egg of keeping them in play to get the work that they're doing done. So our our hope is that we're far enough through the study with them that middle of next year we really know where we stand which is about when we hope to if everything's going well to maybe identify what that first phase would be financially what we can uh, afford to build with the dollars we have available so about right. this time next year that's my hope yeah. it, it, and it really is dependent upon the pool i think we've lost maybe some said six months but i think we've lost more than six months kind of getting through this process with them but again I, I feel for, for the them. dollar amount we're talking about. It's still and, worth it. And really, the, the ten million is good news. But from my standpoint, is they do all the permitting, which is probably worth about another five million at the end of the day if they take care of all of that, as opposed to us dealing with it. So it's. Um, Listen, can lake water, the storage fit into that? So I mean, if we're, is it, the purchase of that is that a lose it or use, use it or lose it type of opportunity or? And where does it fit in the timing? Um, I put it in the budget just so you would start seeing it and knowing what we're talking about. But it would be dollars in lieu of uh, doing the work at uh, Lakewood Lake as our secondary source of water during a drought. And so whether that's next year or the following year, just kind of depends upon how this project. But it's within a couple of years of having water to bring through the channel mm -hmm. as a as our backup source to our surface water water right. <coughs> just following up on that, is that something that we could defer to 2021, or is it, are we looking? Highly possible. Right. And, and we won't fund it until right. we know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, and, and no, no, I'm telling you something you already you can know, but this would be the, the budget allocation right. for in a position to fund it, but then we're still going to have to come back with right. a project scope right. and right. project authorization and we know more. I, if I was had everything squared away, I don't think it'll be in 2020, but uh, if everything went really great, possibly it's probably more likely in the following year. But I, I wanted to get it in front of you and let you know it's out there and be aware of what it is and why we might need to do it. Right, and it, it remains part of the river project, so it's not as if it doesn't get spent in 2020, we're going to reallocate it to another expenditure as much as it's out of factored that. into that overall project budget. Yeah. Comes out of the total 
dollars we have available at the store. I just had a couple more questions. Uh, not, and not on not on water, so whenever we're ready to switch to a, a different topic. I guess that's now. Okay. <laughs> this is a small one, but it's the hike bike trail. Um, one of the things that I had a question on with the hike bike trail is I've continued to get a lot of um, feedback from bikers, walkers uh, about the trail and tra trails that we do have, which I think is great, and I hope we, we, we keep building on those, but about the maintenance on the trails in terms of like the sand burrs, um, uh, whether they've been treated with like that, that packed um, gravel stuff. Some of those are pretty rutted, and it's like I'm all for expanding the the hike bike trails so that we get a, a functioning work around the city, but at what point do we make sure that we are we're keeping up the ones that we that we actually do have? Because what I don't want is we get the network done, but it's so um, neglected that nobody feels comfortable riding their bikes on it or whatever. Uh, we made conversations about the sticker and, yeah. and thorns, and uh, when I say we, myself and the staff, and we looked at. Part of it seems to be mowing the levees and, and discharging onto the trail and taking right. the thorns up. And we, we do spray, we do we attempted to spray on a regular basis, but it just doesn't seem to uh, be a sufficient deterrent. So I don't know if Jim has new information or additional thoughts. Or well, it's been a difficult year just for maintenance and mowing and those kinds of things. And oh, yeah. We performed our normal routine spraying operations, but this grant is, is for a Either a concrete or asphalt surface, okay. multi 10 foot multi use trail. So it'll be higher grade than most of our levee trails and those kinds of things. So. And that was that's for the that's for the Y one, but I'm just talking about like the uh, regular. You're, you're talking the, about the, 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 the fifty thousand. Yeah, right, just the fifty thousand. Okay, I don't know. I thought you were talking about the one up here. No, no, but that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's I think fantastic. she was talking about the one at the top of the list. Yeah. The, there on the next page. No, at the bottom of the list is the Ohio uh, line. Yeah, this is just the, the annual high pipe trail allocation. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. It's a yep. tiny item, but I just wanted to. What what I can say is um, flood control staff has sprayed and continues to spray the levee surface um, multiple times throughout the year. We have a dedicated sprayer on the supervisor's truck who drives the levee um, completely and sprays whenever he sees it. Um, we've had reports of burrs appearing two days after we've sprayed. Um, this is an extraordinarily wet season that allows growth at a, at a rate that even the best <coughs> chemicals have difficulty um, protecting against. Um, and it, it, we're, also, we're also limited dry by- or wet, it's a challenge. We're, we're also limited by the types of uh, chemicals that are allowed to be used on the levee because they have to be w water safe chemicals. Right. Um, and that definitely limits us. Um, I mean, we, we, we're we very familiar with the problem. We track it on a regular basis. We, are, we try to do our very best at spraying whenever we get a complaint. And unfortunately, a lot of times that's, you know, that's what it is. There's Three people in flood control uh, in 28 miles of levee, but uh, I mean we, we but try it, to act. I, I can say with confidence it's being sprayed regularly. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then my final question was on the street enhancement um, program, the reduction that we're going to be doing in that. That was one of the items in 2016 when we passed the increased sales tax that we had. Um, we had referenced that specific 3.7 number when we were doing the promotional work for that. Is that, isn't that I mean, is that correct? We did, um, yep, and we tried to cover that as part of yeah. our 2019 budget right. conversation, but that's why we continue to focus on what's our total spending. This, this is out of, um, yeah, in terms of the PIP, but our, our total number. Uh, 2019 budget is 7.4 million, 2018 was point, paid, paid step almost $7.2 million with debt service and other funding sources that we're spending on streets. So, and I, that's not lost on me by any means in terms of um, kind of that, that marketing campaign. 
I would say, uh, and I feel like there's noticeable improvement in our student quality. I think we can see from 2016 to the present, we have been able to gain considerable ground. And I don't think this is going to show a noticeable decline in street maintenance for ahead of the game for a while. I, 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 this is one of the last things I wanted to cut, but I think there's a balance of everything that's really in play. I know it's good that we shifted the priorities for other funds towards streets. Yeah, we had gas tax and some other funds that were Remaining balances, and we said we're going to try to right. so spend that. Is that, that, is that a one-year fix, or is that anticipated to be the future approach to fulfilling the promise to fix the streets? Right. Well, in all honesty, in a, in a broader sense, we don't have a history of our revenue keeping revenue growth keeping up with our expenditure growth. So I don't, I, I don't think I can tell you this is a one-year fix. I think we're, we're doing all we can to get the budget balanced this year and. And next year, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be pretty pleased if we just saw enough revenue growth and not have these large conversations again next year. And it goes back to the sustain, sustainability question and where we're at an imbalance between expenditure growth compared to revenue growth. Have we discussed that, Mike? Uh, the 3.7 spending was predicated on a certain collection of sales tax. Sales tax has yeah, fallen true. short the last couple of years, and it's a subsequent reduction is kind of how we looked at it. So we're just my starting mind. to get to the projected numbers about now. Um, but yeah, you are right. We, in addition I, don't to remember, I don't remember seeing that. Yeah, but, uh, I thought the three point. I thought the three point seven is what we committed to spend, and it didn't have anything to do with. Declining sales tax or anything like that. Because well, what, well, what Jim's saying is when we did the 3.7, we anticipated what that sales tax increase would generate in, in additional revenue, and we're just starting to actually see numbers that match up to that project. But yeah, but that's not what we put on. I mean, maybe that's what we thought. I mean, maybe that's what we thought, oh, but I mean, what right. we put out on the paper didn't, and we shouldn't go back on that. I mean, at all. And I think if, if this is kind of a policy question for the for the five of us, but if we're when we are looking at um, lower than anticipated sales tax revenues, it might be good for us to just sit down with a, a list of, you know, what those are and what our commitments are, because we might say that, you know, we want to keep the 3.7 whole, but we prefer to sacrifice something else that's that's on the the, the sales. Our sales tax commitments, whether you know it's for that year or for for years right. coming, and the, and that's frankly why staff developed that right. sales tax spreadsheet. So right. We have a sense of right. you know, the breadth of all those commitments. Right, uh, and, and that's been that's that's been helpful. But I guess we also need to take a look at them. But if we're going to say that's <clears> what it's for, I mean that's you know we need to put it out there saying okay if we don't meet a certain Criteria or a certain goal that we're not going to do it. I mean, but we didn't do that. We just said that it was that 3.7 was going to go toward that. Uh, yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. I'm trying to, in, in the marketing piece, uh, let me find it back here. We, we identified about six different priorities for the use of the funds. We projected what the anticipated revenue would be, and then we did. Typically articulate 3.7 as uh, the projected number for street work. Jim's correct that we we did not and when the sales tax increase went into effect, we did not hit that projected revenue amount, and we're just starting to get close to it now. Um, and so I don't necessarily uh, disagree at all. But we said 3.7. We did identify about six different things: everything from property tax stabilization to economic development. To um, park improvements um, and the drainage and the water line replacement, we cut that that commitment in half as well. So, so you know, that that's not out of the sales tax. It wasn't. A, I thought the additional the water line replacement was not out of the sales tax. Yeah, that was just. Was that storm storm? Or was that utilities? Water utilities. 
Okay. The stated the priorities and they they're just listed. They aren't uh, priority in priority order necessarily, nor are they allocated proportionally. Are improve neighborhood streets and drainage, preserve a stable property tax rate, ensure a quality park system, constructing and maintaining community improvement jobs. And then with respect to streets, it says the new sales tax will generate about four point three million per year in new revenue. About Paragraphs of information, but it's actually says 3.7 for neighborhood streets. It's perception is what it is. Make a difference. So I guess it was 3.6 rather than 3.7. Nonetheless. All right. Otherwise, it does look like the business. Yes. Obviously, we don't. You know, it only brought in a million. We can get 23.7 million. This is a tough one. And Just when you're not, you're not approving the projects at this. This will come back to you as approval of the CIP at a later time. This is just really approving the allocation of sub CIP funding, which is your high park trail, the vehicle and equipment, that allocation of those funds in the budget. But if you're but, telling but us you want us to spend 3.6 million rather than 3.2, that does affect the budget. Because yeah. then so that's all a part of the right. CIP. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, but the total street budget is seven million, almost seven, and there are other sources that contribute to that effort. Yes. And what I'm hearing you say, if we spend three point seven and we never realize that in the sales tax, we are really ahead of where we might have been if we know the numbers. So there is, we might have adjusted that spending. So I'm comfortable with the decision being made. I don't see anything on here that I would want to get rid of. Well, Got to buy a fire truck. Oh, yeah. And definitely want a fire and bleed. I'm um, just looking at the water storage from Canopolis Lake. If that, if that truly is going to happen in 2021, then I'd like to see it off this list. I mean, even though the funding sources. Well, it says it's going to be paid out of the sales tax fund as part of the replacement for. So, with that $1.35 million that we have allocated, those are all included in that number as we add these little projects to make those out of that. And then the water storage definitely planned for 21. Or definitely she said it probably won't happen until 2021, so we won't have to pay debt on it until after that happens. So, it was perfect that it would happen in 2020. No. With the way that that project's been going and delayed, we're more likely to fall one year. So, but in offering problems rather than solutions, but if you're if we're going to honor the other commitment that was communicated, we we're going to take and can we co debt and apply it to the right. right? Well, and I think that's where that list that. Um, Debbie made for us that spreadsheet of where we are in terms of commitment. And, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, maybe we did have the conversation, but maybe I didn't quite get the feedback that I was wanting to get from it in terms of, of all of our sales tax obligations. You know, what's going to be what's going to be the first to let go? Um, you know, what do we as a as a group, and whether that's five zero four one three two, whatever. What's our consensus for what's the most expendable project? If that's streets, great. If that's, um, you know, I don't know, water storage, great. You know, <coughs> whatever. whatever. Exa exactly. Whatever we still have any um, flexibility on. Because I know that each one of us has our non negotiables or what we think are non negotiables. But, um, well, and I, the staff one so far is to. Put that spreadsheet in order left to right. Of, yeah, we have debt payments great. that well we done. can't get out of. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, uh, anticipating you know, this conversation, I guess maybe I naively thought that it didn't really get, get pushed back when we brought it up the last time, so we were good. But it, it's definitely a, a policy decision that we're very mindful of coming into this process. This. With the anticipation that we might possibly move the water to 2021. Yeah. Okay. 
and in anticipation. Do we have one more budget study session next week? If we needed, you were going to have the draft budget. Yeah, right. and we have okay. one after that that's kind of our leftover one. So we have one week to. If we can just now, 10 or 15 minutes to, to just review this, our sales tax commitments as a part of that. I mean, I know I've, I've, I may even have put the materials in this book, but. Um, uh, are you talking about next Monday or next Monday? Uh, an interest to and if it's not find the only one, then then just keep 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 on moving. Yeah. Measure can, twice, cut once. We can certainly provide that spreadsheet if you need. Okay. The next one should be easy. So I'm sure we'll get to one more. <laughs> Well, I say that. Yeah, fund balance targets. I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> yeah. We kind of went through all those in detail, uh, talked you through those. Um, economic development fund, uh, we carried a funding target of 50000 and uh, we have a balance in there, 670, 680. Um, so we recommended that adjustment. I would tell you that. There's an allocation that goes into that fund, and that fund is available for EDO, SEDO annual funding, which we've committed to, as well as in the economic development request. And so, incrementally, at the moment, we're losing a little ground in annually on that fund balance without making some you know, economic prospect type incentive. I can't say enough good things about how Tim Rogers and Mitch uh, Robinson were able to pull together one vision without any city funding, so that was helpful. Um, but if we if we have need for a large contribution, that kind of an annual commitment and a little bit of fund balance there, but not a lot. Special gas tax, uh, just trying to uh, reflect kind of how we carry that fund and our intention to spend that down. Um, our sense of the need for that balance is primarily limited to if we, and Public Works does a terrific job of putting projects together and putting them out to bid early to try to get competitive bids and to get some flexibility to get on contractor schedules. And so maintaining a little bit of the balance in there lets us avoid contract early. There are communities, not necessarily our side, but there are communities that can't even award a contract because they spent most of the year collecting enough revenue to pay the bill. So we're trying to keep a balance in there that's reasonable. We talked about the health insurance fund. A um, couple things going on there. We, we actually have accumulated the space to where things are in the passage of time. So we're recommending the target fund balance be increased. We've also talked about rather just uh, stopping our contribution or lessening our contribution for a while and draw that balance down. By doing that, uh, we still leave the health insurance fund at a healthy point, and no pun intended. And uh, just what was that balance? No. Was it six? Was it? Well, I where I was headed is we think we can, by end of 2020, get the general fund. The general balance. fund, but what's the balance on the health? We have a target of two, but it's. It's about four at the end of 19. Right. So as of now, we're not placing funds back into that, correct? Well, that's what we propose as part we of 2019. Are. And we, we, we are. I thought we were. I thought well, we were the intention is coming back to you and yes. authorizing that change and then not to, to right. fund that because right. basically what's happened is we're short general fund, but really it's kind of like we have dollars that have been allocated to a fund that it really doesn't you know it doesn't need to be there. So we're really two million long in right. that fund and two million short in our in our general fund. Well, and if, and I know you all. If know it was this. my business, I'd be able to transfer. Right. From right. bucket A to bucket B, but we're not able to do that because of the. Well, you know, I, the like I, said, I, know, I know you all know this, but we're self-insured, right. so it's not. We're not talking about the premium, not just paying right. premiums to a carrier and not having coverage, and it is a trust fund, and so right. that's what it causes us to need to change our allocation rather than just right. take right. funds out of that. So we can do the same thing next year. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we get to a point where we see we have funds that's not being drawn on because of claims, we can go ahead and not fund it and it still be above that. Too and, and we have stop loss coverage per incident, but you know, experience is, is a big factor in what, what we actually see in terms of expenditures and what it does for the fund balance. 
And I would anticipate that fund was set up by resolution, and part of the resolution said that, that the revenue was going to be coming from the operating funds. What I, I would anticipate for us to stop that operating fund transfer, we would come back to you for some sort of resolution that says for this period of time we're going to rewrite. Okay. The next typical conversation, pay plan. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit, providing quite a bit of information in terms of uh, authorized staffing, budgeted staffing, and some of the assumptions that went into that, and we boiled that down to uh, the cost of COLAs and merits and combinations thereof for, across the uh, general fund in particular, but across the organization and so uh, we broken it down to five options uh, one is neither merit nor cola another is two percent merit and no cola conversely no merit and a two percent cola two percent for both or alternate direction which you see fit um, I tried to also then provide you kind of the cost for each one of those and with, with the way things are currently budgeted, uh, if that's something that is supportive of funding, um, we calculated the corresponding mill rate that went to go with all those different scenarios. Um, the other thing, well, we've also had conversations about you know, do we need to make uh, pay rate adjustment by job classification or adjust pay plan general? And so, our open starting rate and then top end. And it, it is more costly because it takes back January 1 rather than an anniversary date. It's not going to catch us up in terms of where we're behind on pay rates, but it, we're not digging our hole that much deeper. Um, if we, for that seven year period where we had no COLAs, if we did, well, pay rates would be about 15% more than they are right now, which means that we uh, conduct a pay study versus just start moving numbers around and tweaking job classification because we have, we have multiple things going on. Comparison of responsibility by job title within our own, own organization and, and equity there. We've got uh, comparison to other municipal organizations and other employers in the community that we compete with and then trying to avoid any intended or un unintentional compression between adjustments that you make to one region and not another. Um, so I, I, Projected as part of that 37.8 million, that was just a swag um, in terms of uh, what we saw historically. Uh, projected that you be an added annual cost of 1.5 million going forward. Until we do a pay plan, pay, until we do a pay study, I don't really know what that is. So I just threw a whole lot of information at you, but as it relates to this, question number one is uh, support for COLA or merit. And then knowing that uh, going along with that is the need for no rate to fund that. Well, that's the reason I like the COLAs. We have a third or a quarter of our employees who aren't eligible for a merit pay anyway because they're top down. Mm -hmm. So if we go with number three, then it's just, it's just the COLA alone. Mm -hmm. And without it, we're losing money. Yeah. And plus, we're already behind. It. We, without doing the study, we believe we're already behind the, the pay curve. So, just so we're so that yeah. yeah, we're looking at an increase in the mill levy, even with the increased valuation. Yes, accounting for the county's revised numbers. Yes. Accounting for. A little bit of uh, operational gain in the budget if we did nothing. We calculated the mill rate needed to fund a 2% COLA at 0.62 mills. Yeah. And I said it before, but I'll say it again. That's not sustainable. And the only way that's sustainable going forward is we continue mill rate increases. I'm not yeah. saying that this is our long term annual plan. It's a band aid. Yep. Yeah. 
you've got to. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm just a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, well, we're getting close, but it is some reservations time. Anyone who wanted to discuss something other than what we're discussing or what we've been discussing is not one of the specific floors of sorry for my voice. Sure heard it yesterday. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> just want to make a comment about the uh, River Festival uh, to relate an experience I had last year and the year before. Went to the Roots Festival in Paola, Kansas, which is in the Kansas City area. Paid $20 for a ticket in advance, 25 at the gate. Went to a two evening festival with one stage, probably a total of about eight groups maybe six food booths, two or three children's entertainment areas, and virtually no arts or crafts. So in comparison, what we offer is a real bargain. I think the Festival Jam by itself is more than I got there for my 20 or $25 a ticket. Um, they did have one thing that we did, and that was a chili festival alongside the festival grounds. <laughs> but you didn't get to participate in that unless you paid extra to participate in that. But you know, we wanted to add a chili festival out on the uh, TPAC grounds. We could do that. You know? so, <laughs> I just wanted to share that because it is, you can look at festivals all over the place, and I think you're going to find a wide range of entry costs as well as a wide range of entertainment and events that are offered. But I still think that in comparison to many communities, you know, $15, $20 is still a bargain for the three full days of piece of music. Okay, I'm lying my age, I suppose, um, that we get, get for that. So for what, what it's worth. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, we have uh, six more minutes. <laughs> Uh, the Daniel Trigg Teachers Movement Health Insurance. We were lucky enough to come to you with uh, we'll propose no increase. Yeah. And anybody opposed to that? Okay. Um, emergency radio systems. We talked about this at great length. I would tell you that there's a there's a key leadership group. Uh, County's very actively involved. Our public safety police fire uh, are also involved. They have been doing a terrific job behind the scenes of due diligence and, and leaving no stone unturned and. We're still working it all through. This is a, a placeholder that I think probably gets us in the ballpark. And, and the reason we need a number now is in anticipation of putting a system, a final design system out to bid in the fall and hoping to award the contract in the spring, we would need the allocation. It, this represents um, our share of radio costs for our users, police and fire primarily and public sound as well. And then we have an arrangement with them about inmate housing and dispatch services where we provide dispatch services. This number represents our portion of for dispatch service, our cost for radios, and it's all kind of on the premise. Number one, uh, it's mostly on the premise that the county is willing to fund the backbone uh, countywide, and then we're going to be able to allocate sheriff's department costs to them and uh, rural fire protection district costs. We might be able to get the, the cost of the system down significantly with some of the work that they've been doing. And I wish we had this all tied up and had a hard number for you, but at this point, in conjunction with the county, I think this is a, is a conservative number for us to try to break. And it carries with it a million increase as well. In the event that, that we're able to save additional money, um, that either could represent revenue for public safety in general or it could just represent revenue. General fund, um, but I hate to find ourselves underfunded and holding up the bid process and contract award coming up soon. How much is, do you have any sense for how much the county is going to be raising their mill levy? Because I'm assuming that they're participating uh, yeah, doing the same thing. Point eight, they? Remember, I so if they're at two, 
roughly 2.8, mm -hmm. and we're at 0. 0.703 for this, and how much? Mm -hmm. And 0. 0.62 for the. 1.33. So we're at 1.33, and they're at 2.8. If it helps at all, the, the numbers we've been talking about with the radio system are purchase, operation, and maintenance. So the initial estimates include kind of that 15 year. Uh, equipment replacement and some of those things. So hopefully this should cover those costs long term. Because the county's 2.8 included. And in all honesty, I don't know their allocations, how they got to 2.8. I was under the impression that the emergency radio system wasn't necessarily driving that entire number. It was just kind of a conclusion of the budget process.